trickle in. We'll just get started. Good morning, nurse of family and friends. Uh, welcome to Nurse in Motion. Uh, sorry, it's Ideas, Nurses, Ideas in Motion. Today's webinar is called Nurse in Motion 2025, where we'll be exploring the future direction of campus recreation, what we need to do to positively influence well-being, equity, and inclusion in our profession and beyond. I'm Mark Triaga, your host um, with Bonobo Consulting, and I have over 20 years building inclusive programs and communities through my work in senior leadership roles at several institutions in student affairs, campus recreation, and community development. And I started Bonobo uh, to help organizations shift focus from systems to people, fostering belonging where everyone feels invited, welcome, and included. Uh, this webinar series is hopefully a little bit different as uh, I'm not calling uh, our guests panelists, but nurse of friends and family. And really what we're hoping for is a, just a good conversation, uh, authentic conversation, which may lead in different directions, may lead to some colorful language, though I think the three friends we have today are pretty good at keeping it clean. Um, but, you know, things can, can go off track quickly, especially when we start talking about the future and where we currently are sitting in a pandemic. Um, so, i uh, like to introduce our friends here. So this morning we have Candace Douglas, who is the Assistant Director of Facilities at Western Kentucky University, overseeing facility operations, aquatics, risk management, as well as many other duties as assigned. And I think that's on everyone's job description. She's been in campus rec since she was a freshman at Austin Pay State University in 2001, where current NURSA President David Davenport exposed her to a field that would change her life. She has a passion for helping students and that passion also led her to serving on the Emerging Recreational Sports Leaders Conference Committee and the Board of Directors for Empowerment Inc., a nonprofit whose focus is to equip young people with the tools to make positive life choices. Also joining us is Rochelle Williams, who's the Aquatics and Youth Programs Coordinator at Western Washington University. And also she's been currently hosting the Nurse Aquatics Roundtables and is the chair of the Rec Chat Committee. She loves carbs, coffee, cross-stitching, craft beers, and crossfit. She also loves alliteration. Rochelle will be a director one day and hopes to be part of an original Rec and Wellbeing Center building design and construction. And one of the reasons I asked her here today um, is because I remember from a conference uh, several years ago where Rochelle stood up in front of the assembly and said that she was going to be NURSA president by 2040. So I'd love to hear her voice today. Beware, beware what you ask for. <laughs> beware what you ask for. So hopefully everyone knows Stan Shingles already, but if you don't, he's a native of Chicago, Illinois, and is a graduate of Illinois State University with both a bachelor and master's degree. And he has more than 35 years of professional experience and has worked in university administration for more than 30 years. He is currently the Assistant Vice President for University Recreation and Student Engagement at Central Michigan University. And his nurse uh, resume is too long to read, um, but you know has pretty much done it all. And recently, in a more recent conversation, learned that uh, you know, being able to chair a committee was one of the hardest things for him to do, given his resume, which uh, might be interesting to bring into when we think about what lies ahead for us in, in, in the future. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I like to start these conversations with what's important to you? What's happening in your life? And it can be professional, it can be personal. We all know we've got issues with COVID and reopening and all that. Um, so if that's really what you feel like you want to share, that's awesome, but it doesn't have to be necessarily focused on that. So let's start with Candace. Candace, you're reopening this morning. You have students on campus for the first time. How's that? Um, it's, it's really busy. Um, I'm not gonna lie, it's a little nerve wracking. Like you said, we've got the COVID situation going on and uh, as most of y'all can probably imagine, not all students are on board with all of the safety measures that are in place. So doing a lot of heavy educating. Um, and then of course, to find out that um, one of my graduate assistants may potentially be positive for COVID at the moment. So finding a lot, doing a lot of working around and covering in that instance and planning for the contact tracing and folks that are gonna be out for that. So that's kind of, my focus at the moment, the most important thing is like making sure that that is okay because the university wants us open. So I've got to do what I can do to make sure that we stay open um, is where my focus is currently. Rochelle? Um, as I'm potentially working from home through January and I live in a predominantly white community and our university is 98% white, 
it's really important for me uh, to continue to educate myself about my privilege and continue to help drive those conversations within my department and be a part of those conversations within NERSA and the Western community. So that is what I've been, and also I work in aquatics, which is a, a very, very, um, it's a program that's like steeped in like systematic racism. So um, it's important to understand what barriers to entry there are for my program and for campus recreation specifically, and just seek out that peer edited like research and facts to begin to create sustainable change within my program in my department. Mm -hmm. and, and if anyone doesn't follow Rochelle on Instagram, I would highly recommend it. Um, very active with a lot of information and, and, and knowledge sharing that I, I know I, I appreciate because it's hard to curate that stuff. So following Rochelle is a great way to get that curated information. And Stan, what about you? Well, we just uh, finished week one of school uh, here. Um, feel a little bit like uh, lab rats uh, in terms of trying to figure this out. Um, you know, we've seen the, the challenges that are happening across the country where we're no different, um, much like uh, Rochelle and, and also Candace in a, in a rural college town, which has a little bit of benefit to it because, you know, it's not densely populated. Um, it's it's um, uh, small in numbers comparatively, uh, but nonetheless, I mean, that brings a lot of challenges in and of itself. Some of the social isolation that goes with that, some of the the um, um, I think there's a tremendous um, lack of sense of security about what we're we're dealing with because we're in a small town. People don't think that bad things are going to happen here. So we we got through week one with lots of challenges, um, holding our breath during during week two as we learn more. And um, you know, this is a this is a very very difficult time because we can talk about COVID, and we know that COVID has really impacted um, our way of life. is is uh, certainly impacted our liberties, uh, but we're talking about you know continued uh, racial injustices in this in this uh, country. I was watching uh, the news this morning and saw the situation that happened in Kenosha, Wisconsin. I have a very dear friend who is a counselor at the university there uh, that I reached out to this morning. And of course, it's turned that community upside down. Um, so it, it's so many issues that we're, we're, we're dealing with. Um, obviously, last week was the Democratic National um, Convention, and you heard the platform um, of, 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 you know, that, that um, um, you know, the, the Democrats, and now we're going to hear from the Republicans this week. Uh, so much of what we, we're, we're experiencing is being politicized. And, um, and that's, that's going to have a direct impact on the work that we do because uh, students are engaged in those things and what they bring to, to the table certainly is going to be, it's going to challenge us as administrators, challenge some of the norms uh, that we're used to. And, and um, um, it, it, it's going to be interesting. So stay tuned. Mm -hmm. so that's really interesting because, you know, we brought up three things, COVID, you know, uh, social uh, un unrest and, and Black Lives Matter, and now political statements and things really, you know, taken away from campus rec, which has been the focus of student well-being and, and traditionally through physical activity. Though, you know, all the three other things obviously really have a, an important role in, in student well-being, mental, physical, social, all those aspects. And so when we think about what campus rec looks like in 2025 and, you know, Candace, you talked about us earlier about, you know, the fact that you've been listed as an essential service and, and, and you know, many institutions have been listed as an essential service, yet, you know, we're being asked so much in this field, right? Um, you know, it, it's not just about an aquatics program anymore or, you know, that the pool, you know, pool, pool mechanics are, are, are down. It's about curating and facilitating and navigating the student experience of well-being that goes beyond our job description. And one of the key things that we talked about, you know, prior to, to this webinar and getting to know each other is this idea of 
you know, if we're an essential service and we lack the resources and priority and actions that demonstrate this, how do we in Campus Rec continue the journey of proving our value to institutions beyond our buildings and programs, especially, you know, during these times when we are being really taken away from what we feel as professionals or what we've had from the start about, I get in it because I want, I want students to be active and, and have social and have fun. And a lot of what we're talking about isn't, isn't fun. It's just not fun. How do we get back to that fun? And, and what is our, you know, what is our, our, our opportunity? And what is our, our um, you know, responsibility to do that as professionals? Well, so, oh, go ahead, Stan. Well, I was going to say, I, I think it starts with, um, you know, that sense of belonging. I think we are, um, we're, our, the needs for what we offer is more important than ever before because that, that sense of belonging. Students have been in isolation in a whole lot of ways since March where they haven't had some of the, the experiences within their communities uh, on our campus, um, whether in, in our world, whether it's in their programs, whether it's in their facilities, but in, in many instances, um, you know, we're the lifeline financially you know, for students uh, through, through employment. Uh, right now in the state of Michigan through executive order, uh, we can't open our facilities for, uh, for that sense of belonging. We can for academics. There are 15 state universities in the state of Michigan. None of them can open right now for our traditional offerings of facilities, programs, and services. Um, boy, the impact on uh, students' well-being is is um, is is probably going to be an all time high. Uh, we had an incident here this weekend where students were at a pool party over capacity, in, you know, in a pool party. Young people outside, no social distancing, no masks. W would that have been different if our if our program offerings offered them an alternative to that, where they could come inside and be in a pool where we're going to require social distancing and enforce it? Um, it's, it's um, I think the need for what we do and when you're starting to see some of the impacts of that not being available to young people over the last five, almost six months now, um, I think elevating, and, and we could talk about where we do it and, and how we do it, but what we do, I think is, is more uh, important than ever before. And we have to, you know, we have to, to continue to find ways uh, to tell that story and some of the behaviors that are taking place, um, especially here on our campus, certainly uh, helps me to understand that there is a void right now. And and to, um, go ahead, Rochelle, sorry. Oh, no worries. Um, to kind of go off, Stan, what you said, like, what is it that we do? Most of my family members have no idea what I do. And so the way that I, they don't understand it. So the way that I describe it is I help um, 18 to 24 year olds become moderately functioning humans. And you take them where they are, you hopefully help them gain transferable skills. Like I've had lifeguards that have been able to interview their way into HR positions at Amazon starting at $80,000 a year because they truly understood the value of their lifeguarding positions and the skills that they had that they were going to bring into those positions. And when I first started out, because I'm, I'm heading into my seventh year as a professional and when I started out, I understood that stuff, but I very much stuck to student development as um, how it was prescribed to me. And then as I've gone through a lot of um, professional development myself, I've understood that my aversion to having tough conversations and conflict, which is very much like a Pacific Northwest nice thing, um, but living in Texas and then living in DC, like you have to have a lot of tough conversations with people because communication styles are very different across the United States. And uh, my communication style didn't work in Texas or DC. So I had to pivot and grow a lot. And so understanding that I had to continue to talk about things that I wasn't really comfortable with, like something people don't think about is within aquatics, a lot of female lifeguards are sexually harassed constantly by patrons. And that is something that all of us, all lifeguards kind of know because you've experienced that creepy old man or that kid that won't leave you alone. But until you put a name on what's happening and you give people the tools to be able to successfully handle that situation, like 
that was a game changer when I was like, wow, this is happening to me as a professional. So it has to be happening to my student staff. And um, that is, I think, how we're going to be able to continue to pivot as we move forward with these bigger conversations, um, especially where I, I mean, not especially where I am, but it's kind of all over. Like I have students with political views kind of across the board, like fairly liberal, but kind of across the board. And it's creating conversations and explaining things to people in a way that everyone kind of understands their role and everyone starts to have those tough conversations with themselves because you shouldn't leave college the same person you entered college. So that's kind of my, like it's uncomfortable for me to continue to have these conversations with people, but I think every year if I'm not creating situations where people are uncomfortable and really take a look at themselves, then I'm not doing them a service. And that's also why like I fire people when I need to and I have like really tough teachable, like I, um, I subscribe to like radical candor as my leadership style. And that is very much how I try to coach people through conversations to help them have like these bigger moments, but, and, and that's not fun. <laughs> and, but it helps them when they get to their next you know, place of employment and they're like, what are your weaknesses or what are your areas of improvement? And they know what those are because when they have their self-reflections every year, they're able to like critically look at themselves. Um, and so it's been like, I want my job to be so much fun all the time, but it's also been challenging in the last probably four years to understand that most of the time, my job makes me uncomfortable. Agreed. I will piggyback on that, then I'll jump back to my point, but that's part of what we hit on and we emphasized tremendously during our staff training last week was you're going to have to be okay having those difficult conversations and asserting yourself more, even more now in this time of COVID than ever before when it comes to enforcement of policies and, and providing explanation to our patrons as they're coming in. Um, but I was gonna hit on the other side of that question towards um, we're not necessarily focusing on our students. Well, our students, yes, but also um, getting outside of just the physical wellness and talking more and focusing more as campus recreation on the emotional and mental wellness aspect. And, you know, I am lucky to be on a campus that we have a health education and promotion area that falls underneath our campus recreation umbrella. So we're providing that outlet. And so even when um, we were not open, our doors were not open, we were putting out information and ways for people to link with our department and other departments on campus that we collaborate with to make sure that we're taking care of that mental and, and uh, emotional well-being aspect. And that's a direction that I think a lot more departments are going to have to move into that they can't, they, that we can no longer just focus on having the doors open, making sure that we have intramurals running or a pool that's available for them to use. But we have to focus on building the entire person, not just with the staff that we have a really good hold on and, and have a captive audience with, but everyone that walks through our doors. And so that's where that data collection and um, that research comes in. Um, I mentioned this, Mark, in our previous conversation, but uh, uh, Todd Meisner was the assistant director here a few years ago, and he, uh, that was part of his thesis while he was working on his doctorate was the effects of campus recreation on, on uh, matriculation through the, uh, for the student body. And so he was able to pull some information and using that to explain to um, the folks up the hill how important and why, why our department is so important to this campus. Um, now, if our, our, our paychecks would just reflect that, that'd be awesome. Well, and, and I think that's the other problem is that I know every place I've ever worked, people have been like, like even when I was a GA at Texas State, I would go to these giant like meetings with other student affairs. And if you weren't a Sahi GA, they thought you were useless. They were like, oh, you work in campus recreation? That's fun. What do you actually do? Do you play games all day? Do you swim laps? Do you sit in the hot tub? And 
I really appreciate the direction NERSA has been going in the last couple of years where we're not just campus recreation professionals, we are higher education professionals. Mm -hmm. And it has, it takes so much effort to get out of our silo of campus recreation and like join committees on across campus to kind of put that name to a face where it's like campus recreation isn't a fluffy profession. We're doing really good work and we're an essential service. And I think it's going to take a, a lot of us to really push on our campuses to help our universities and colleges understand that, like, our importance, because we have the same level, if not more, education than a lot of our peers, and I feel like I'm usually not taken very seriously on my campus sometimes, depending on where I am, um, because of the department I work in, because they just view us as fun and kind of, like, fluffy. But they're, they're learning, at least with me, I, I was asked to serve on, uh, we've created a graduate institute here at WKU because, um, of course, we've lost all of our funding through 2021 for any professional development. So we want to make sure that our graduate students still are able to get some sort of professional development um, during their time here. So um, in sitting on that committee, they were like, oh, well, we need to figure out how we can manage this and that and this. And I was like, well, this is what we're already doing with our graduate assistants within our department. And it's just like mind blown. They did, your, your GAs do all that? Yeah. You know, we don't, you know, they're not just give them some keys and let them open the door and then they hang out behind the computer and, and they're in the building taking up space for their 20 hours a week where most of them are working, even though we try to send them home more than 20, wet, wet, well over their 20 hours a week. Um, you know, we got, we got our hands slapped a few years ago because a GA not from our department was complaining because they were asked to work more than their 20 hours a week, one week out of the year. And so all of us got kind of audited on how much our GAs were working. So that's why we tell them, hey, your 20 hours are up. If you're here, you're volunteering your time at this point. But our GAs, we can't make them go home because there's that type of work ethic that comes from people within campus recreation and folks across campus are really seeing that um, more so in the last couple of years, at least here at WKU, um, than they have in a while. You know, what's, I'm, I, I wanna ask you a question, Stan, where I'm coming with this is that, you know, when, when I started in the field and Candace, I think we're around the same age. I think Stan started playing basketball in a peach basket. So yeah, you know, yeah. Be a little... me, and Dr., me and Dr. Naismith, the boy. <laughs> but, you know, it's this idea that you know, when we started, a lot of it was just about, yeah, just make sure the basketball league ran, make sure there's some fitness classes and that was it. And then, you know, as that growth and development, we saw this idea of, you know, we need research, we need data, we need to prove that we matter and all that. And so Stan, you're someone that's even before that, that saw that journey and was a part of a lot of the leadership creating changes in our profession. How did we get to where we are now and what do we need to do to even advance it further so that Rochelle doesn't feel like, and all of us don't feel like that we're not taken serious on campus. I mean, you know, your role, and you can even talk about your, your, your current uh, interim role, right? Demonstrates that there are places that value that experience, yeah. um, but there's still that, you know, young professional feeling that, yeah, they just think we play as opposed to what we're already demonstrating how important we are to student well-being and, and that holistic student approach, which seems to be the mission and outcome of every institution in North America, yet maybe the, you know, the resources, the prioritization of what we do isn't necessarily seen to, to do that all the time. Well, and, and, and I think it started with, and you know, I'm a baby boomer, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm proud of that. Um, and, um, you know, I think about my experiences growing up in Chicago, growing up as a young person who lived in the inner city, who had all of the challenges of living in the inner city. And the thing that, um, that I gravitated to uh, during that time is what we called extracurricular activity. And, and, and that sounded wonderful. And I'm a, I'm a product of that. I'm a beneficiary, uh, beneficiary of that. I grew up during an era when um, secondary schools and uh, primary secondary schools were used as um, uh, additional facilities to support uh, leisure and recreation and sports and and um, and and 
I, I lived on a block where my elementary school was. My mother taught at that school, taught, was an elementary school teacher. And then I had two, two recreation centers within another uh, two blocks. So I was inundated with recreation. But we were called it at the time extracurricular. The pivot on that was probably 15 years ago when we started calling it co-curricular. Uh, lots of faculty upheaval with us uh, in student affairs, believing that our, um, our mission, our vision, our values in terms of what we did outside of the classroom was equal to what was happening in the, in the classroom. And so I think that started the, the, um, uh, the, the change that we needed to see uh, because everything extra was being cut. Those, those classroom buildings, they used to call them lighthouses back in the day for recreation, they, they, they don't exist anymore because school districts started saying, we can't afford to keep them open. We got to worry about instruction and education, safety, all of those things. Now those things don't even exist. And we wonder why we have in the inner city gang problems, truancy issues, uh, teenage pregnancy, everything that you can think of because if you don't give young people um, um, anything to do. It's the old adage of, you know, the idle mind is a playground for the devil. And, and that's generally what, you know, that's generally what happens. But to, to Rochelle's point, our greatest challenge as we now have pivoted from extra to co is still telling the story. I think we still fall short in telling the story where when we have a seat at the table, we're still maybe a, little, a bit too apologetic about who we are, uh, still maybe suffer from a little bit of identity uh, issues associated with that. And I've had the unique vantage point for the last couple of years to be an AVP in student engagement. And my VP gave me areas that we saw uh, that should be integrated together, not consolidated, not combined, um, not assimilated, but integrated. Because one, we all know we duplicate things on our campus and we duplicate them and, and we call them something different. And sometimes it's in the interest of job security and, and, um, and, and relevance. But uh, today uh, with, the, with the margin narrowing and resources, we have to be a little bit better. My uh, VP gave me a challenge this summer of looking at our uh, student affairs area, which is a new um, unit here. We, didn't, we haven't had student affairs in a lot of years and start looking at how do these things integrate better. And as we the pre assessment, we realize a lot of what hit this button. is very, very, very um, similar to what's being done in student activity. Yeah, it automatically it's starts with the camp. Uh, multicultural academic student services and, and other like departments, very programmatic and you know, a lot of what we do in facilities is being done in residence life. So how do you integrate those things? How do you tell the collective story? And I think where NURSA has really come in is helping to elevate that, you know, as a professional association with, uh, with the data that we have developed and have been able to mine over the years, whether it's the value of campus recreation, a uh, study that was done a few years ago that uh, evidence this is important in the student experience. And Candace was speaking to the um, uh, employment piece of, of the experience and, and Michelle as well, uh, career readiness. We, 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 we're, we're the best at doing that along with residence life on our campus, but we continue to say, well, it's just a job. You know, when you start talking about the experiences that students gain and those competencies of critical thinking and problem solving and written communication and, and um, you know, digital technology, you know, the, the platforms that we're using uh, in, our, in our campus recreation programs today are the technologies that individuals pivoted to um, when, when COVID hit. So our people are used to distance learning because we offered uh, training and development through, through, um, through technology, not always through face-to-face. -face. And, and of course, when we start talking about the whole notion of you know, intercultural fluency and global fluency, that's extremely important. The world is different 
than it was when I grew up during the Cold War. You know, today the world is big and it's open and it's, it's, um, it's more readily available. So I, I share that because I think we still have to, uh, we have to get past our own modesty and, and maybe even a bit of our own insecurity about who we are. We're not physical education. Uh, we're not athletics, we're collegiate recreation. And we should uh, proudly champion that. And I think the platform of well-being allows us to do that because we fit squarely in, in that well-being. And of course, that, that domain of well-being that we oftentimes uh, associate ourselves with is the physical uh, domain. Well, that's not, you know, mental health is as much a part of what we do then, you know, especially when you go back to reading books like Spark um, that, you know, talks about, you know, exercise in the brain and, and, and things like that. I, I think we just have to continue to tell that story and be confident as uh, professionals uh, to do that unapologetically and um, with, with, a, with a, a, a confidence and, a, um, and, and the information that I hope, that I think will help our colleagues to better appreciate what we bring to the table. So here's the challenge, I think, is that, you know, and I've seen this, I'll use an example in Canada, there's a thing called participation that talks that gives a report card to adult activity and Canadians got a D minus. And they talk about all the things we're not doing. And, you know, again, there's a lot of studies and research but the behaviors aren't changing. So, you know, again, the value of, of campus recreation and that research that nurse has done is fabulous. It's wonderful information. And it's true. We all have experienced it, but it's not changing the behaviors of our institutions necessarily. And so when I think about things like roles, right, you know, Rochelle, you use, you know, um, uh, radical candor, right? That's not in your job description. <laughs> it doesn't say to do that anywhere, right? And in fact, many job art descriptions don't even talk about student development. I mean, it might in a vague terms, but it doesn't talk about, you know, what are those outcomes that we're looking for from our staff to be hireable and, you know, and great global citizens, it really is transactional. It talks about, well, run this program, you know, so many job descriptions will say like, okay, you need to run, you know, this, uh, 10 sport intramurals that has X amount of participants. You know, Candace, it's about running these facilities, making sure, but so the story is there, but I'm not sure we're doing the greatest job of sharing that story in a meaningful way that's not just a white paper or not, you know, and in Candace, you talked about, oh, great, I, you know, I got a GA, you know, you, you talked about something you were able to create off your experience. So how do we do that as professionals by actually demonstrating this so that people understand the types of conversations you're having with students, Rochelle, that, you know, again, counselor and career developer, and, you know, and social connector. I mean, we're playing all these roles, but on paper and what often administration sees is fun and play, fun and, act, fun and activity. So, you know, if you were in charge of all the institutions, how do you, how do we do more to, to share that story? It's documentation. Um, one of the things that I ensure or I make sure that I do every year, we have to submit a report uh, to our a VP of Enrollment and Student Experience. That's what Student Affairs changed to here a few years back. Um, of what we were able to accomplish every year. And always included in my report is the amount of training, what we discussed. So if we did a DEI workshop, if we did a transferable skills workshop, um, the number of students that we graduated and how many of them ha had been placed in positions, our resume workshops, all of that is included. It's not just, you know, redid the floors and the, you know, and, drained and did this to the pool, we may, I make sure that any report that is sent outside of this facility up the hill to VP, president, whoever is, is outlining the work that we are doing with our students as um, employees and programs that we are offering to our students as external programs. So um, until this year, because everything went mostly virtual, our department would take part in the freshman orientation program where we went over the eight dimensions of wellness with them and what within our department was available to them um, to meet each one of those eight dimensions of wellness. Even if it's financial and you need a job, hey, 
we're hiring. That's part of your financial well-being. Now, managing that money, which we do money management workshops for our staff as well. So we make sure that we're hitting all that. And then we outline that and share that with folks up the hill so they don't, so they know that we are more than just opening the doors and letting, you know, folks come in and clang some weights around or shoot a basketball. Well, and anecdotally, we've started doing um, the, like an alumni catch up on Instagram live and like not every Friday, but um, fairly regularly um, from our previous staff alumni. And it's really wonderful to hear about their experiences working at Campus Recreation and how most of them, almost all of them, and by almost all of them, I mean like 100% of them, have said that working at Campus Recreation has been the best job that they've ever had. And that the skills and situations that they were in while they worked for us um, has like really have helped prepare them for what they're doing in the future. I also, and again, putting things in writing and documenting things, I started having my staff do staff about like, not, I'm not gonna say self-reflections, but something along the lines of a self-reflection as a part of their um, self-evaluation because I have them self-evaluate and then we talk through it every year. And um, they're, you know, just asking a couple of pointed questions and having them write kind of about their feelings about working and some challenges they've had and what I can do better and things that they've gotten out of it that helps me do my job better, but also helps me see what they're getting out of their job. Um, and I, I teach a beginning swimming PE class for college students. And it's that I don't have them take a final, I have them write a self-reflection to tell me what they've learned about themselves during the process of learning how to swim as an adult. And um, those self-reflections have been very, very insightful and useful as far as proving the worth of what we're doing. Michelle, if, if I was in your class, I would be writing a self-reflection that I've had that class three times and I still can't swim. Stan, you so, need to come take swim so with me. I'm a wizard. <laughs> I'm going to have to come see you because I've been trying to swim oh. since I was seven and I still can't swim. So I, I stay away from, I stay away from water. That's such a shame. It's the best yeah. thing in the whole world. I know. Um, yeah, if, if, you got to get comfortable in the water and then you can do whatever you want. I, I, I don't know. I think I need hypnosis or no, or, I, take, I don't I know. Take I need something because my fear is great. I take people from not wanting to put their faces in the water at all to blowing bubbles to being able to swim butterfly in 10 weeks. I got to come see you. Never been to Bellingham, uh, Washington, but I might have to come that way. I'm I not going to say no time like the present, but when we're not in a pandemic, any time. Are, so I won't be getting on a plane anytime soon. Uh, earlier, we talked about job description. And I think this is really important. Uh, what's in the job description? What's not in job description? What, what should be in every job description is student learning. We forget. That's why students come to college. We know that there is a socialization and a development that goes with but student learning is the outcome. So as we start to engage in this co-curricular model, uh, we're, we're built for it. You know, student learning takes place in all domains of our, of our um, campus recreation you know, operations. Uh, we have internships, we have leadership development in our sport clubs and through employment. We, I mean, the list goes on and on. And what, what, about, what better human subject laboratory can you have than a recreation center? where you can get people in, in, in different uh, research exper uh, experiences that you might be looking for. And I don't think we, we talk enough about uh, student learning in campus recreation that fosters that relevance that because if this is viewed as extra or, or subordinate to, then it's gonna be a losing proposition. Uh, I've never seen a school and I, I see April on this, Call, so I know this will make her smile. Uh, James Madison, I've never seen anybody able to take uh, student learning and learning outcomes and leverage it uh, to resources like I've seen at James Madison and the work that Eric Nickel and his staff have done there. It's, it's remarkable, but it started with 
engaging faculty. They have a campus recreation curriculum there. They have an outstanding relationship between the academic and the campus recreation department to a point that, um, that I think it's the model institution that others now have emulated a lot of it, but uh, they're, I think they're, they're one of the front runners in it. And I think it's something that everybody should subscribe to because uh, it certainly supports that relevance that sometimes is lacking uh, as we try to tell our story. It's interesting you mentioned that, you know, the idea of collaboration and working across campus for those same student learning outcomes rather than this idea that we often feel like we work in silos, right, with other yeah. health services, faculty, counseling, student, all, all this seems very siloed sometimes rather than collaborative. And so I, I think we could talk about, you know, the, the whole profession itself, but I'd like to maybe move on to, okay, what does Campus Rec then look like in 2025? If we have this vision that, we, so we've demonstrated we matter, we've collaborated across campus, and we're all on the same page for this idea that we're all part of the, the student outcome of student learning and, and mental, physical, social well-being. What have we done? What what are the programs look like? How do we address some of the social unrest, this idea of inclusion, and really the whole idea of this whole webinar series for me is this really how do we make students feel like they belong and, and and in this case how do we make students all students feel like that campus rec is a place where they belong where they can come as their authentic selves and participate in a way that makes them happy about their body movement happy about the social connections and then their their self-reporting that because of campus recreation i have completed my degree. I have grown and, and, and developed as a student. I, you know, the student learning outcomes happen and in whatever way they feel is necessary, whether it's co-curricular or just because, yeah, you know, like Spark, I, I, I had that opportunity to ignite, ignite the sparks in my brain through just fun physical activity. How do we get there in five years? Maybe, maybe it won't, maybe it'll take a lot longer, but how do we get to that? What needs to happen? And maybe we can look at it from programming, a facility standpoint, a holistic standpoint. How do we get there? So from what we're starting to do at our campus recreation, and I also, I attended a webinar that was titled um, White Urgency is Violence. So it's important as white people who are trying to be a part of creating systems sustainable change that we're a part of creating sustainable long-term change and we're not create we're not hasting to create wildly inefficient and harmful like things for the future and that was eye-opening for me because I like know nothing and so I was like okay cool so the first thing that we identified is trying to look at barriers to entry and barriers to access for our campus recreation program on our campus and trying to again do the the research to find historically why people aren't accessing our programs and then also begin to look at why people aren't applying for jobs at our facility and um from there figure out like because most of our like aquatics is easy if you don't have the if, if you haven't had the access to swim lessons then you're not going to want to take a lifeguarding class because you can't pass the swim test to take the certification course. So how can we remove the barrier of people not knowing how to swim or not wanting to know how to swim? And then how can we funnel people into those programs if that's something they even want to do? And um, I know we had talked about like, if you build it, they will come, that type of mentality. But if you look at, like, especially my campus, it is very much a part of that like white supremacist culture that like it's been built for by the builders like the architects were white and how did their backgrounds and their experiences help shape the space that we currently inhabit and how do we recognize where they came from and figure out where we need to go in creating those open spaces and offer programming that people of all spaces want to attend. So um, we're, that's something that's like big picture and it's gonna take us a long time to 
talk to people, to figure out what we're doing, to understand our biases and how our experiences are kind of, and are, I'm speaking for me and my department at Western, because um, our department is almost 100% white. And so figuring out how we reach the Ethnic Student Center and incorporate the Queer Resource Center and the Veteran Student Union and all of these other people that we don't typically see ever in our facility and try to create an open dialogue where people can come to us and we try to have, con or we've had conversations previously where people have given us feedback about the vibe of the rec center or the weight room or the pool or whatever it may be. And we've started to make some changes, but it's also trying to make sure that we're not getting defensive about the feedback that we're giving because understanding that somebody's perception is their reality and that that's where we need to meet them. So for us, it's being, you know, Western, we're really trying to focus on understanding how we can start to create something for everybody. And Rochelle, just to jump on there, um, I can 100%, you have to meet the students where they are and then acknowledge what's important to them. So yeah. I'm in Kentucky. I am two hours away from Louisville and half of my student body was in Louisville rioting or marching or whatnot with the Breonna Taylor situation. And that is something that new students coming to campus and parents sending their students back to campus are concerned about and how each department is going to make sure that their child is safe while they're here. But one of the things that I mean, of course, student safety is important, but one of the things that was a conversation for us was we had students that worked with our department that were like, why haven't y'all said anything yet? This is something that is important to us as a department. When are you all going to acknowledge what's going on in the world? And as a department, being okay with not always taking the popular answer um, we, I understand we all work for a university. We've got people that we have to answer to um, and, you know, statements that can't go out unless approved by this person, that person, and another person. I get it. I understand. But being able to communicate that in, in some way to our students that we are there for them and we're here and what we have available for them to when, when they're feeling having these issues. And then when it comes to like those barriers to entry, having those conversations, but don't promise them something that you can't actually provide. So we had a full focus group brought in probably about 50 or 60 students from our staff, from SGA, from um, the African American Student Association, the Graduate Students Program, and they sat down and they helped our architects build the campus recreation facility of their dreams that right now the university is not willing to fund. So now you're like, well, you're listening to me, but you're not making any changes. So we need to make sure that us and the university are on the same page for these changes that we want to make in order to make our spaces more inclusive and that the, the university understands the importance of why we need to make these changes so that they hand us our, those funds that we need to do so. You know, it's, it's interesting as we as we start as we talk about relevance and uh, to um, Candace's point and and to Rochelle's point, Egypt uh, also about physical place. One of the things that ha we have to be honest about is uh, how how important is physical place going to be after after COVID? Uh, we're, we're we just onboarded um, freshmen. At, at, in the state of Michigan, not just at Central Michigan University, where the the core of their uh, onboarding and orientation was their access and exposures to our facilities um, from a from a um, pre admit standpoint, where they were coming through for tours during orientation, making their decisions. What none of that's been available to them um, when they when when we have. Uh, programs that start before, or programs that happen before classes start, and they normally take place in our physical place, 
uh, our training and development. We've all of ours has been virtual. So we're going to have to do a real assessment of what the what the importance is as a physical place because we assessed in the in the past the bigger the better. But to Candace's point of that inclusiveness of how you get students engaged so that uh, the space that's being built and designed has purpose. You know, we talk about 2025, 2028, my grandson will be a freshman in college. We're making decisions today about what's going to happen for him almost 10, you know, almost 10 years from now or eight years from now, he's 10. Um, which means we're, we're thinking for fifth graders <laughs> is what we're doing. Um, everybody laughed in one. I remember having a conversation with Pam Watts when I was, when I was president and we were talking about this emerging thing called eSport. And we kind of put eSport in the activity category because it just seemed like it was a bit of an anomaly and that it wasn't something that fit into our domain of programming and, and, um, and even, you know, our, necessarily our philosophy, because it had this kind of sedentary kind of culture to it. So we thought uh, it, it seemed like it was, you know, the kid in the basement who was, who was, who was, who was a couch potato who, um, you know, doesn't want to socially interact with anybody. We came to find that that's not true. And now we're embracing it and we're, we're, we're building facilities throughout uh, the country and oftentimes repurposing space in our recreation uh, facilities because it was space we built in the 80s, 90s, 2000s that's now irrelevant. We have more court space on college campuses in many instances than we can use today because we were building those courts for capacity in Emerald Sports where we've seen a decline in open recreation where students have so many different uh, options and opportunities. So how do we repurpose uh, that space? How do we innovate for what students need today versus what uh, we traditionally hold on uh, to as what we what we built yesterday to justify the relevance of still having that space? And I think that's going to be the big question because, you know, the, the student fee game is up with state legislators, <laughs> they're now coming in and saying, you, you know, your, your fees are more than your tuition. What are you doing? And then, you know, parents asking a question, what, you know, what's the value of that? We know what it is, but selling it and just selling it as, I remember, I don't, most schools that built recreation facilities in the 90s and early 2000s all had t-shirts that said, build and they will come. That was the philosophy, build and they will come. And, and they did. And now, now what? <laughs> we built residence halls and we filled those up. Now students are saying, I'm, you know, I, my son's an only child. He never shared a room with anybody until he came to Central Michigan University. That was hard for him. And he kept saying, can I get a single? And I said, well, can, first of all, can you get a job and pay for that? Because we're paying for it. So, you know, you're going to have a roommate. <laughs> and, and, I, and, and I say that for reasons of, you know, this ever-changing landscape that sometimes uh, we're, we're not nimble in responding to, and we've got to get better. And it's institution. So I understand uh, it, it takes a lot of change, but this physical place thing is really uh, a game of cat and mouse right now because we want, do we need more or do we need to repurpose what we already have? I, I think we've got to evaluate more having a purpose and repurposing what we have being a goal because we just can't say we need everything that we already have, but we need more of it as well, especially in declining um, enrollments, which, which is driving a lot of the decision-making. Well, and that's where, you know, I think a lot about, again, what is our outcome and are we changing behavior? So you can build a new rec facility that's brand spanking new as all the bells and whistles, but is that just displacing the, the students that are already engaged because they get the value of sport and rec, they, they enjoy it, they feel like they belong, so they're just transferred over. But if we're not changing the system that creates those barriers, it doesn't matter how inclusive this space may look. If those students don't feel like they belong for whatever other reasons of barriers, whether it's 
you know, not enough staff look like me. You don't have the programming. Uh, you know, I, I don't feel fit enough. I didn't grow up in that area. And so you mentioned esports, and you know, I grew up with video games. Um, I don't belong there because <laughs> you know I played Frogger, <laughs> and, and and you know so then I think about. You know, hey Mark, I play Pong. So, oh, I had you know, Pong. Yeah. I had Pong too, yeah. but don't get me wrong. Miss Pac-Man was innovative for me. <laughs> so, yeah. But now, you know, again, the eSports is created for those that grew up in an eSports environment. So we're providing the program for people that already had the program available because they were playing. But now we're just saying, well, let's build fancy facilities so they can play over here with us. And I'm wondering if that's the strategy versus – how do we get other students who might see the value of connecting through playing video games socially? Because there's not a lot of learn to play Fortnite or learn to play, you know, whatever. My seven-year-old daughters can create worlds in Minecraft and I don't know what it is. And so this is that idea of, are we just providing the same resources to those that already get it versus what are we doing to change the system? And facilities are going to play a role in that. Programming is going to play a role in that so that, you know, we put that emphasis on the outcome rather than the place, because like you're saying, we're virtually programming because we don't have the space. People can't come to the space. But I feel like we are defined by the rec center, by the bricks and mortar, rather than the outcomes of student belonging, student physical well-being. And how can we do that? Yeah. Mark, a couple of the things that you said I wanted to touch on. One, it the students that look like me. All right. So this is my second institution that I have been to where I was the first person of color on staff and the students that were working the areas that I oversaw were not very diverse as well until I came into being and then that mode changed to where students felt more welcome to come. So whether that students who look, the, there's not anyone there that looks like me is your administrative staff or if it's the students that are swiping people in at the front desk, because prior to me being here, there were not any uh, students of color that were in a supervisory role. So whenever someone got in trouble for something, it's because I'm black or because I'm an ESLI student and y'all just don't like me in here. And so X, Y, Z. So that it doesn't have people who look like me goes beyond the professional staff, even though I think universities and departments should be deliberate in making sure that they do have a diverse staff, whether it's people of color, color um, uh, orientation, or uh, gender, definitely should be a diverse working group. One, because you just benefit so much more from that diversity of ideas that come from the lived experiences of people from different backgrounds. But you need to also be deliberate in hiring students of color, um, students that English is their sec uh, second language and things of that nature, which I make sure that I have done in all the institutions that I've worked at because that is how people become comfortable coming into spaces when they see people that look like them. Outside of that, one of the things that we do here on, in, our, in our department, we have a student wellness program called Well You. Um, it's trademark, sorry. Um, <laughs> but uh, we offer incentives. So we, it's a scholarship program. We offer incentives for you to participate in a group fitness class or an intramural sport or attend this lecture on um, uh, safe spring break activity before you leave for spring break. And the more um, events that you participate in, the more points you receive once you reach 15 uh, points, that's a $500 scholarship just for, just for interacting, coming in the door, or, and we have two, well, technically three facilities. So, you know, that gets you into programs that are working on all of your different well-beings. And if we're doing that, that's how we touch a lot of people who don't show up to um, just play sports. We had one um, event that we used to call it Friday with Friends, Finding Respect, in everyone's natural differences and similarities. That was a collaboration with our um, counseling center. And it was just a once a week or once every other week on a Friday, students sat and they talked about the issues that were important to them. It was open to anybody on campus, students and professionals, anybody on campus, 
and it's just a time to for, for an hour to communicate, get to know each other, find what's what's important to you, and how we can affect change on this campus. And that was it. Like I said, a collaboration with our department, counseling services, and they got well you credit for it. So everyone that they came to, they came every week or if they came every two weeks, that was a point towards their 15 points or scholarship. And there's a lot of folks that came in there. It's like, my town didn't have black people. So I don't know how to act around them on this campus. Or, you know, I've never been around a person who identifies as a different gender than what they were born as or anything like that. So that was an opportunity for them to be educated so that there is more of a sense of belonging and inclusivity on this campus through that program. So it's finding ways outside of our normal operations to engage students where they are. So it wasn't, you know, some of them took place in our facility. Some of them were in the student union where we could just grab them while they're walking through for lunch and saying, hey, we've got this program going on, want to stop by. Um, but getting outside of our siloed area of I never leave the Preston Center, so I don't know what's going on in this building or that building because I'm so busy here, which is a fact. Nonstop busy, but sometimes you have to turn it off and leave your space so that you can meet them where they are and, and get them engaged in that manner. Great. Now it is just past 11, but I do want Rochelle and Stan to have some final thoughts because I'd love to hear their voices. So um, this is being recorded, so if people do have to go um, we'll have this, but I think uh, I'd love to hear Rochelle and Stan, your final thoughts on this idea of, you know, 2025 and, and, and getting outside of our spaces and creating that sense of belonging for our students and staff. Rochelle, I'll let you go first, if you will. Um, I think, <clears throat> sorry, um, I am really excited for what is to come. I think on a larger scale with a lot of the budget cuts that are happening, we'll the U.S. version of how we funnel people into the professional positions will probably move more towards how people find jobs in Canada. So I think we'll be hiring a lot more coordinators right out of undergrad. Um, and I hope that GAs will still exist because I really appreciated my experience, but I also think there's a lot of value in hiring people and giving them the opportunity to learn and grow straight out of undergrad, especially as we begin to face massive budget cuts and declining enrollment. And I think that I am hopeful for the overall movement towards um, structural change within higher education in creating, beginning to create a more equitable system and um, place that all of us can find our community and really begin to learn and grow and um, have the same experience that I had in undergrad and grad school and right now because I still love working in campus recreation so those are my hopes yeah well I, you know I think we all know the power of education it's, it's trans uh, transformational uh, so this is going to continue uh, we know that because it's important uh, the piece that's at jeopardy is uh, the work that we do uh, that comes with um, uh, lots of lots of needs uh, in terms of resources and and but I remain optimistic because I think we you know especially as I look to 2020 2028 when Jaden Shingles will be enrolling uh, in college and I'll be that doting grandparent uh, probably showing up on his college campus to embarrass him uh, like my parents did me when I went to college um, but you know whether it's Harvard. Princeton or Yale, we, we don't know, you know, there's no expectations for him whatsoever, but wherever he decides to go, if he does decide to go, um, I know that this is going to be an essential part of uh, his experience. So I'm optimistic that uh, the future of our profession will understand what the needs need to be, what the priorities need to be, and to pivot in that direction so that uh, relevance is sustainable uh, purpose is, is, is re-evaluated re uh, based on what's needed um, now and in the future. And, and again, I, I know nurses are going to play an integral part of that and, and educating us as our professional association and providing um, support and resources for us. And, um, and I hope to be, you know, sitting on in some warm location um, 
applauding the great work of, of, of our colleagues in collegiate recreation as we as we envision as we envision a future. Well, thank you very much, the three of you, for your voices and sharing. Um, I've got to know all of you in, in different ways, and you know, I'm, I'm, when we think about Nurse of 2025 and beyond, you know, knowing that we have three leaders such as yourselves with different passions, uh, maybe the same passions for that student development and learning, but different backgrounds and experiences, creating that change, I think we're in pretty good hands. And, and so, you know, and that's probably the best part of being a part of the Nurse of Family is knowing that we're in good hands with the professionals that, that, that are in our field and the networking and the sharing that we do and the resources, you know, the understanding that we don't feel like we're in competition with each other is one of the biggest uh, benefits of NURSA because together uh, through our collaborations, through our sharing is where change is going gonna, is gonna to happen. And, and it's just wonderful. And, and so I thank you, the three of you so much for your time and energy. Candace, uh, you know, we can pretend that this goes on for another hour and a half so you don't have to go back to the, to the fire that might be happening outside your doors. But uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. This is the last of the series. So if you have any feedback, thoughts, um, please feel free to share with us or with NURSA. Uh, hopefully we're gonna reconvene and think about uh, if this is something we'd like to move forward with, with regards to a conversational series and, and really having that authenticity, which our guests have brought today. So thank you so much. Stay well, everyone. And uh, yeah, have a great week. And for those that are starting up, be safe. And, and hopefully we're not uh, changing things in a couple of weeks. So thanks so much, everyone.